I'll give people a minute to join, see if we end up with any live viewers here. Yeah, how's it going, Mark? Pretty good. How are you today, Zach? Pretty good. It's like I just talked to you a second ago. <laughs> that is, isn't it? Uh, well, thanks for being on here today. Um, we do have some live comments that will be coming in. Uh, in fact, I've got one I can show right here. This is so cool, Tish. I agree. Um, really cool platform here, and we thought it would be fun to uh, get Zach in front of our audience here. We'll keep giving people a minute to join. Uh, hey, Corey, how are you? You guys go ahead and comment if you're here. Uh, tell me where you're from. I'm imagining most of the people here are going to be from Chattanooga, but always good to know. Hey, Jessica. Hello. Thanks for joining. Um, so we thought it would be fun to get Zach on camera and see if we can't embarrass him a little bit. Uh, got uh, Rosie from North Carolina. Hey, Mom. <laughs> hey, Mark's mom. <laughs> um, Zach is literally up in the attic of our welcome center. And you can kind of see, I'm going to switch over to just you, Zach, so you can show him a little bit about your space up there. Uh, it's a pretty good attic. It's probably the best attic I've ever been in. Uh, so I have a really big space up here to um, do a lot of work. I've got a lot of cabinets for all my projects. I've got um, a herbarium cabinet where I keep uh, plant collections, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, I store a lot of my field equipment up here. And I do a lot of office work uh, during the wintertime and non-growing season. And then usually, if it wasn't for COVID-19, I'm traveling uh, pretty consistently from April to October. So right now I'm using this time to catch up on a lot of uh, writing. Hey, Terry. Hey, Terry. Welcome. Hello. Well, uh, if you just joined recently, uh, we're, we're giving people a, just a minute here to join before we get started. We're talking with Zach Eric up in the attic here at uh, Reflection Riding Arboretum and Nature Center. And I'm coming to you from my version of the attic, the top floor of my house <laughs> from downtown Chattanooga. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you guys can see that. I'm going to take my banner. I learned last time that these banners stay up when I go full screen, which I can't see. So Zach, if you see something on the screen, tell me. Yeah, I can see it. If it shouldn't be there. And then I'm going to go full screen right here. And what we're talking about today is a, a continuation of our whole series that we've been doing on the City Nature Challenge. The City Nature Challenge is a global biodiversity inventory. Um, you can call it a bio blitz if you want. And there are a number of cities all over the globe that are participating this year. This is Chattanooga's first year. We are the local organizers here at Reflection Riding. And the City Nature Challenge is organized globally by the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. So it started as kind of a friendly rivalry between L.A. and San Francisco. And uh, those guys have done a great job kind of putting all this together and, and making it a fun challenge. We on the as one of the organizers on this global team, we have been in a series of meetings over about, I don't know, a six month period. And obviously the COVID-19 pandemic began uh, fairly early in that process. And we started having conversations about what the city nature challenge would look like this year. And we ultimately decided to forge ahead and, and do the challenge. Uh, we do have some organizers in places like Italy who are not going to do the challenge at all because they just don't feel it's appropriate to talk about it right now. Um, but here in the United States where most of us are under some kind of stay at home uh, directive or at least suggestion, we have decided to make this kind of a, a stay at home edition. And what that means for most of us is that we're going to be out in some kind of backyard or along uh, the local streets in the neighborhood, that sort of thing. Probably not going out into the big protected areas uh, or, or local parks like I think we all normally would be. Um, but what's interesting about that is that's actually going to produce a lot of great data for science. 
Uh, one of the initial reasons why the City Nature Challenge initially kind of came up was iNaturalist platform has a ton of cool observations coming in from all over the planet, but it definitely has sort of a natural bias towards those protected places. And scientists, especially as we are increasingly urbanizing all around the world, scientists need to know what's going on with biodiversity in our own backyard and on the streets of our cities. And so that's kind of the, the where the City Nature Challenge came from. And so today, one of the things that I see also is that clearly in terms of species biodiversity, plants are going to be your place to go find a ton of biodiversity. And even in, I live on the south side of downtown Chattanooga here in Tennessee, and we just have a ton of biodiversity within, I mean, three blocks of here. I can see all kinds of cool things. So plants are also one of the things that are hardest to identify uh, on the iNaturalist platform. And so I wanted to get Zach in. He's our botanist in the attic, and he is a research associate with us here at Reflection Writing. Um, and he's actually uh, full-time at the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. So Zach, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Tell me a little bit about your position and how you found yourself in the attic. <laughs> uh, so a lot of the work that I do with the South Asian Grasslands Initiative is uh, inventorying and monitoring rare plant communities and uh, rare plant species, and then doing a lot of work, of course, with uh, the different grassland systems across the Southeast. And I do a lot of taxonomic work and uh, collaborate with a lot of people uh, to do just a variety of things, but uh, some of the work that I do uh, for the National Park Service um, is actually much more, all the parks that we go to are much more closely uh, in distance to Chattanooga than they are Clarksville. And so we were looking for a place to rent an office space, and I didn't really know anywhere to go really, and we talked to a few people, and then someone actually uh, recommended Reflection Writing, and I didn't know you at the time, and I emailed you, and I think I heard back within 30 minutes, and I came over, and it was pretty much a done deal. We just had to wait for the funding to get set up to actually rent the space, and it happened, and everything was ready to go, and it just seemed like a natural fit, and everyone was, you know, really great and very cool. And if you're going to, you know, to me, I'd rather be here, honestly, because it's like when I get tired of doing, you know, computer work, I can go walk around and actually, you know, look at great plant habitats. You know, there's some really significant areas on this piece of property. It really is a nice place. And it's a great place to go regardless of what you want to do. But for botany, it's it's really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been really fun to explore it and, and learn more about plants um, from having you there. In fact, Zach has brought me along on a couple of really cool uh, trips. You're going to see, Zach, uh, one of the observations from the – one of those trips in uh, this presentation. I'm gonna switch over to full screen and keep going with the presentation about iNaturalist. Zach, stop me if you see an interesting comment that you wanna bring up because I can't see the comments when I go full screen. Okay, okay. All right, so first off, and I said this in, in the last one, uh, hopefully some of you guys were on the last one, I know a couple were. Um, we miss you, this is what Reflex Routing looks like more or less right now. I think I actually took this a little bit further into the summer, um, but it is a gorgeous place. Can't wait to have you back. Um, we hope everybody's doing okay after all the storms and is staying healthy. Um, but first off, to get started with the City Nature Challenge, go sign up for iNaturalist, follow our project, uh, make a few observations today. The, the challenge actually starts at midnight. So if we have any night owls, you can actually get started uh, tonight. And then uh, we're really going to focus on this one on number four, which is we want you to create verifiable observations of plants. And then at the end, we'll take some questions. Um, the sign up for iNaturalist is really easy. You can do it on desktop or you can go find it wherever you find your apps on your phone. Um, basic kind of flow for iNaturalist is that you observe an individual organism. We want you to find things that are wild and take a nice, good, clear photo, which we'll talk about a lot, obviously. Um, iNaturalist is going to come up with suggestions to identify it. And then if you already know what it is, you can choose what you think it is. And then uh, people like Zach are going to jump in and they're going to 
help you with further ID and, and discuss what's going on. And then the point of all of this is that it becomes part or one of the points to me anyways, is that it becomes uh, open data for scientists to use when they are searching for species information and occurrence data. And if it's vetted as research grade, this is why that word verifiable is really important. We're gonna talk about that. Um, if you can get your observations to be research grade, then that means it's actually gonna be useful to science. A couple quick tips for your iNaturalist account. I encourage you to, to use your real name if you're willing to do that. Um, this is, it's kind of like a social network. This is the kind of thing where if somebody comes in and, and Zach, for example, IDs my plant and makes some interesting comments, I'm gonna go look and see uh, you know, what, what kinds of things is he studying? What's he interested in? Uh, you'll find people on here who are really dialed into just one particular thing. Uh, you can see the people that I'm following. There's, there's actually this one guy that's bug eyed FR. He only does uh, super close up macro photography of bugs. And it's just fascinating. So you'll find really fascinating people on here. Um, make some little internet friends. <laughs> uh, so do put your interests in your bio. That definitely helps. And then please license your photos. When you first go through the sign up process, there is a checkbox. It comes pre-checked. If you leave it checked, then all of your photos, sounds, and observations will go up and be licensed for scientists to be able to use it. Follow our project. Go to reflectionwriting.org slash CNC, or you can search City Nature Challenge 2020, and you'll find the project. Uh, I think we've got a lot who have already followed us since I took this screenshot. I think we have something like 20 people now. So let's get that those numbers up and then you'll be notified when we, uh, as things start coming into the project. Now it's time to go make your observation. Uh, all right, Zach, you know what this is? Yeah, that's the uh, Ligonium palmatum from Little River Canyon. Uh, exactly. That range of vision that you took a photo of. Uh, there's a yeah. few questions. There's a few questions. I wasn't, I was looking at the wrong thing. So, uh, okay, cool. Corey wants to know if we'll be able to dedicate time over the weekend to add plant observations for this event. Uh, yeah, Corey, I'm going to plan on it. Um, I've been out a little bit this week, but I'm hoping to do some work this weekend. Okay. Hi, Richard. We got a looks like fun. Here's one from uh, Terry Joyce. Okay, yeah, Terry, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there is some value to those captive uh, slash cultivated is the, the terminology that iNaturalist uses. Um, there is some value to posting those photos, but we'll tell you exactly how to do it here in just a sec. Cool. So, yeah, um, this actually, this Lycodium palmatum, this is a climbing fern that is, uh, this is endangered, right, Zach? Uh, no, it's, uh, I think they're working on the range. Um, it's not endangered. Um, right. Yeah. It's, it's very uncommon. I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, yeah. and this is the, why this is a cool story. And I told this in the last one, so I'll go quickly, but, uh, this is a cool story because I posted this from a trip that Zach and I took on the third day of this year, January the 3rd. And it was raining and it was cold, but it was a fun time. And we were actually not looking for this plant, but this was one of the ones that we saw that was unusual. And so I snapped the photo real quick while I was trying to catch up with uh, the other guys and posted it to iNaturalist. I obscured the location because it is uh, threatened or near threatened. And I think about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, I got an email from somebody who found this observation. They said, hey, you have the southernmost occurrence observation of this plant. And I'm working on a, a management plan for the plant. Can you share with me and give me some more data and, and keep an eye out for more of them? And so I thought that was really cool. Um, this is the kind of thing where, you know, I'm not saying this idly that, that these observations go up and become part of science. Like this is really happening on a day-to-day -day basis and you never know what you might find. There actually have been new species found on this platform by amateurs, which is really cool. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people I know, and including myself, if we're interested in a certain species or genus, we use iNaturalist all the time to find new localities. Because used to, you know, you'd have to go to the herbarium, you know, which is a plant museum we can talk about later. And those are becoming digitally available. But it's, you know, it takes a lot of work to go through all the specimens and get the waypoints. And a lot of the old specimens don't have waypoints. But with iNaturalist, 
I can just, you know, look at, you know, at a map overall and just find all the localities that I need usually if I'm interested in a certain species. Yeah, it's a very cool platform. So here's how you do it. Go find the evidence of an organism, take a photo, upload it, identify it. Um, really quickly, this arrow is showing you the little observe uh, button. This is on iPhone, but it'll look more or less the same on Android. Um, go click that observe button, go find your photos. I definitely recommend that you take photos in the field and then go upload them later. Uh, two reasons. One, you'll burn through your battery really, really quickly, and then you won't be able to take photos of the other cool stuff you find on your trip. <laughs> um, maybe not as big of a deal around the house in the current situation, but certainly if you go on a trip, that's important. Um, two, you can also burn through your data. If uh, And even if you have an unlimited data plan, it's just going to sit there and crank on your data, uploading all these photos. So I usually just take a lot of good photos out in the field, and then I'll come back and sit on the couch and grab a tea or something and start uploading. Yeah, and it also uh, kill your battery too when you need it the most. Yeah, the, ba the battery is usually the big deal for me. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll point out, and hopefully they'll fix this soon. Um, there, I've talked to the developers of this app. Um, they used to be able to you used to be able to pick several images at once and then uh, upload them all at the same time. Now you have to do them one by one. So I do encourage it. It takes a little bit of extra time, but please go put more than one photo of a plant in. And that's what we're going to talk about is what types of things somebody like Zach needs to see on your observation to be able to really be able to uh, to come up with a diagnostic identification. Um, you're going to pick what you think it is. You're going to uh, put notes in, if especially if you take a photo where you can't really tell. Uh, maybe there's like three plants all kind of together. You want to say, hey, I'm talking about the one that's blooming right now or whatever. You can kind of guide the ID uh, with these notes. And then you're going to have a date and time pulled in, a place. Um, you're going to do the geo privacy. Uh, there are two reasons to change this right now because most of us are going to be doing this at home. I would recommend just obscuring the location for all of your observations so you don't just kind of have a big uh, obvious spot on your map of where you live. And then the other one is for something like this, uh, I would obscure it because I don't want somebody to try to come dig it up. And this is your the question that we got about the, the captive slash cultivated. Um, we, and I'll talk more about this too, but this is where if you know that this is not a wild organism, you would just go um, indicate that here. And then projects, uh, there's lots of cool projects out there. For this, the City Nature Challenge project, you don't have to go select the project. It'll automatically show up if you're in the 16 county greater Chattanooga region. All right. Um, Zach, why don't you talk a little bit about identifying it? So we recommend that you only identify to the comfort level that you have. A um, couple things to note, species IDs are not always possible visually. Um, and it's also okay not to know what you're looking at. That's half of the fun of it. And that's how this, that's how I've learned actually so many plants out there. Um, and then you wanna to go to the lowest taxonom taxonomic rank that you're comfortable with, but not any further. Um, Zach, what are you seeing out there on iNaturalist right now in terms of people's plant IDs? Uh, mainly just a lot of the spring stuff. A lot of the uh, showy spring stuff, which um, right now it's you know a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, but mainly if you're taking photos, uh, I try to get a few. And if you're taking pictures of showy spring plants, you know, getting a picture of the uh, flowers, you know, in focus and of the inflorescence of the architecture of the flowers. And then uh, the leaves too, you just want to get good leaf shots. And if there's leaves on the ground, a rosette of leaves, what they call a basal rosette, uh, get good pictures of that. And also uh, for a lot of, for most plants, try to take pictures of both sides of the leaf, uh, the top and the bottom, because the bottom is really important because there are certain um, hair, characteristics or waxy coatings that may be a diagnostic for someone to come back and identify it for you later. Uh, but overall, just try to get, you know, clear images, which can be hard to do. Sometimes I have to use, I'll use my clipboard or something as a backdrop. And, or if it's like a grass or sedge, something that has, that's very small uh, to take a picture of, I'll hold it up against the sky and use the sky as a backdrop. And then that way I can get a good image that way. I um, actually have an example. Let me show you this one. I took one of, 
big one of Dwayne's. This is Dwayne Estes, who is uh, Zach's boss. <laughs> and this is a picture he took. Zach, do you know what this is off the top of your head when you see it? Uh, I would say um, uh, Agrimony uh, Parva Forum. Does that help? That's a good image. He takes great images. <laughs> so here's a good example. And uh, why don't you talk – Zach, about, I mean, what do you see here as a botanist? Um, so he's getting really good images of the uh, stem pubescence. And then I uh, go to the other images. Okay, that's an overall image. Then the image of the leaf dissection, that's really important. So if they're not simple leaves and they're compound leaves, that's very uh, important to get uh, good pictures of. And so he was getting pictures of the pubescence of the stem and then of the leaf dissection, the overall image of the plant. So only other thing I would say here is if you had flipped that over right there, you'd get the, the bottom of the leaf like you were talking about. Yeah. And that, that would be useful. So one of the tricky things that you have to think about as you're out there taking pictures of plants is if you don't know what the diagnostic characteristics are. So if you don't know what it is that, that would distinguish, distinguish between two similar species, you kind of don't know what to take pictures of. And so the, you know, to err on the side of caution, take a picture of, of all of the things that you see on the plant. And it certainly makes it easier for somebody like Zach that's out there later. Um, let me see too, if I've got, oh, one thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, that captive cultivated question that we got here. I've got I actually had a good slide for this. Um, all right, so when we're thinking about getting these good photos of plants, uh, the, the, and the point is we, we're trying to get that research grade where it's something that's useful to science. And what do we need for that? Well, uh, or what are the what are the things that I see preventing that from happening? One is a private location. Um, I mentioned obscuring the location, but don't make it private. If you make it private, it becomes, it's literally just for you. Um, and it's not something that would ever be research grade. Uh, no date. Sometimes if you're using a digital camera that doesn't have the date set correctly or doesn't have the date turned on at all, it'll show up without a date. So um, you can manually add a date, or if you're using your phone, it'll come in automatically, it's no big deal. Um, the other one that makes it not as useful is if it's captured or cultivated, I'll come back to that. Um, the fourth is that bad and bad or ambiguous photography, uh, which is why we wanted to get Zach on here to talk about. Um, so what, let's go to this captive cultivated thing. You can see actually in this delictrum, this is outside my office, you can actually see the little uh, arboretum sign in the background. So that's clearly, it's, well, it's not clearly, but if you zoomed out and you saw that this is a garden, it would clearly be cultivated. Um, I still like to put these photos up for a couple reasons. One is that you can see uh, it, it does, every photo that goes into the system is helping with the artificial intelligence. And so it's making the identifications better over time. So um, continuing to put more occurrence data in always helps for that photography side. And then, also, there are uh, the inflorescence, the, the bloom here is interesting. So even if it's just in your backyard, it's really interesting to be able to tell the time period in which a plant is blooming. And then that helps us too. like if you're a, if let's say you're new to Chattanooga and you want to go find a particular plant and you want to find it while it's blooming, you can go to iNaturalist and pull up a chart and actually see when it's blooming. And we could get really deep, but we won't do it right now. But there are, um, you can also contribute to this scientific project by going into iNaturalist and finding plants that do not have uh, any kind of annotations. And you can actually do annotations. So you can sit there and they have their little uh, keyboard shortcuts that make it fast, but you can run through and say that it's flowering, that it's fruiting, uh, that, it's bud that it's flowers are budding, or that there's no evidence of flowering, which is actually super helpful. Um, so the examples of this garden plants, street trees that were obviously planted. Um, how about invasive plants? I mean, I find invasive plant data to be very useful. And so I take pictures of them all the time. It is of course possible that they were cultivated in the place where they are, but the fact that they are there in the first place is something that I think we need to be aware of as scientists. Um, there's also this concept of things that have escaped cultivation. And so I'm gonna go in and uh, 
Zach, you'll have to tell me what people are commenting on here, but I'm going to play a game with you, which is, um, oh, let me go real quick. So how to market is captive cultivated. I, I talked about it a minute ago, but there's just that little thing on the, uh, on the bottom of your observation where it says captive cultivated, select it, select yes. Very simple. Um, all right, so let's play a game. Should I mark this as captive or cult cultivated? All right, this is the easy one. This is growing outside of my front door. It's obviously cultivated. So yes. But this popped up this spring. I didn't plant it there. What do you think? Comment for me, guys. And Zach, you have to tell me as the comments come in. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm going with yes. Actually, sorry, I'm going with no. I'm not gonna mark this as captive cultivated. No, because it's blue in. Yeah, I don't consider it captive cultivated. It is possible that it was a volunteer that just came in with the soil or that was in the pot when I bought the plant. Um, but I still, you know, I don't, I didn't plant it. I didn't intend it to be there. So I'm curious about what it is. I haven't pulled this yet. You could consider it a weed, but, you know, it's only a weed if you don't want it. It might be something cool. There's that actually uh, one of our research gardens at a university where the students thought it would be funny to plant pot plants. Uh, seeds in the garden and these okay. little pull up and we have to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Do you actually know what this is, Zach? Uh, I can't really tell from that photo, no. Yeah, I need to take better photos for you. Um, but that's a fun one. Okay, how about this? Should we mark this as captive cultivated? Uh, this is across the street from my house. So, both. what's that, Zach? I said it could potentially be both if it was cultivated and then planted. Yeah, this is one of those really gray areas where I don't know. I mean, this is a really old tree. This tree could have been there. I mean, this I happen to know that this road has been here for a long time. Who knows? Um, I probably wouldn't mark this as captive cultivated in the same way that I would a street tree that was, you know, five or 10 years old. And, and, but there's, there's really no way to know. And so that's where there, you kind of get into some really interesting um, gray areas here. How about this one, Zach? What do you think? Uh, cultivated. Yeah. I got in an argument with this one because uh, this is in the middle of a horse pasture. Yeah. So I consider this one escaped cultivation. Mm -hmm. It's not in the garden. It's not something that is clearly been tended. It's, it's just naturalized at this point. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, this is another one where, I don't know. Uh, here's another one. This is a backyard. Uh, this is not a native plant. It was clearly brought here at some point, but it is also not in a garden. It's probably left over from, uh, you know. It's became naturalized. Yeah, it's natural. It, it, it's there from the house that probably it doesn't exist anymore. A lot of these um, plants become naturalized pretty easily, and then they become a huge problem. Like uh, on Lookout and around here, the Lanusa fragrantissima and Macchiai, you know, you see that everywhere, and that's a huge problem, and it's just became naturalized over time. Absolutely. Um, and some of them are prettier than others. <laughs> This is a spider lily that's in the middle of a vacant lot downtown. Um, you actually, one way that you can see it, and if you go back, you see that little um, exclamation point with the pink background, and you'll see that in, in several of these. I actually don't know why the tassel hyacinth doesn't have that too, because it, it definitely arrived in America through anthropogenic means. I don't know. But anyways, if you hover over that, you'll see it says it's introduced to mm -hmm. Chattanooga. Tennessee, U.S. arrived in the, Rhea, in the region via anthropogenic means. Very scientific way of saying it. people brought it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit about what I'm seeing that is uh, not good photography. This is a an actual photo I've seen before. Zach, what is this? I mean, you've got many species there. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. I can see like. I don't know if you can see this on the live stream, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can see like at least 10 species in this photo. Yeah. This is not a useful photo. So what's good? Okay, well, this is the same. This is actually the same. If you look up to the top left, 
um, that is the same plant. It's some kind of flea band. I think this is Philadelphia flea yeah, band. Great for that. Um, so if it's if it's flowering, it's easy, more or less. I mean, there aren't too many that are going to be uh, you know, too confusable <laughs> if, mm. if they're not flowering. But, you know, go ahead and get photos of like we were talking about with Dwayne. Get some good photos of the overall scene. I also like I usually lead with and this is a good one, too. You can choose which one is the kind of primary image. And mm -hmm. I try to leave the one that is most distinct and then kind of go um, more and more generic after that. So like if I'm taking a picture of the whole area where it's occurring, I'll make that the last photo generally. Um, all right, so let's see if there's any questions on all that stuff. And then if not, I'm gonna turn to Zach. Wow. Yeah, um, Zach, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing? Uh, what, what do you see behind you or what are we seeing behind you? And how are you able to identify? Um, so uh, I do a lot of iNaturalist and the way to get uh, specimens that you're taking pictures of uh, documented permanently, it goes into a herbarium and you have to collect a physical specimen. And then I'll just grab this to show you. Uh, it goes into a plant press. And so this is just uh, plywood basically and cardboard and blotters. And what you do is you're collecting, um, you know, it's just like taking diagnostic images. If you're going to make collections, you need to make collections with the diagnostic features to identify those plants. So when you're out in the field collecting, and I actually use iNaturalist uh, too when I do this because with iNaturalist, I can take photos of my specimen and get the locality data and all of that and any other attribute that I want to include. And then I just make the uh, collection. Yeah, sorry, now you can probably see better. And so this cardboard is curated. It helps the air to flow. And this is blotter paper that wicks moisture. And so basically you take newspaper and you take, if it's a woody plant, you take a cutting of that uh, twig to where you've got leaves and maybe flower or fruits, like acorns or something like that, if you're collecting oaks. Or if it's a herbaceous plant, you want all the characteristics uh, present in that sheet so you get overall a really good specimen. And I'll show you what a specimen is and what it you know entails. So and then uh, I don't know if you can see that behind me. That's a herbarium cabinet where plants are stored permanently. Uh, this is just my own kind of work and personal cabinet. And then when things are uh, processed and completed, I send them off to herbaria. So I send them off to our home herbaria at Austin P. I also send stuff to UTC, then uh, quite a few other herbaria. But this is what a herbarium specimen is. Can you see that, Mark? Yeah. So a herbarium specimen, so this has everything that I'm looking for. This is a vine, a group of vines that I study, Clematis, uh, leather flowers. And this is a species that currently is not recognized. So when plants aren't, their names aren't recognized, uh, an author in the past has lumped them into another species concept. And this plant was actually named from the, uh, the banks of the Cumberland River in Nashville by uh, J.K. Small, a really well-known botanist who's now deceased from the New York Botanical Garden, who wrote several volumes on the floor of the Southeast. But um, Austin Gattinger, the first botanist of Tennessee a long time ago, had collected living material and sent this to him so he because he thought it was a new species, and he studied it, and he named it. And it was only known from a few localities, and no one had been able to relocate it from the early 1900s. Well... Uh, it was relocated by actually by Duane, and we've been studying it, and we have a lot of data, morphology, ecology, and genetics data to actually uh, suggest that this is a very good species, and we're working to uh, rename that species right now. But like I said, it's got everything that I want to identify. So with
All right, we're gonna see if we get Zach back on because that was pretty interesting. Um, well, if you guys have any questions for him, let let us know in the comments. I think we're blowing up the internet in general. Yeah, here, um, see if you can uh, just refresh that link. Okay, sounds good. All right, he's coming right back. Um, one thing I can do while we're doing this, I'm going to pull up our, here's that. I'll pull up our project too and see. So my, hey, yeah, my computer just crashed. I don't know what the deal was. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I've actually got two questions real quick. One is, uh, can we use the notes section for questionable escaped cultivation specimens? I'd say, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's definitely what the that's for. And then uh, you will end up having some conversations around that. And then uh, the other one was, how do you press acorns? Zach might be having computer issues. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen and go over to our product here real quick. All right, now you can get to this. Uh, you can get to our project by going to reflectionwriting.org forward slash CNC. And let's see, I'll put that up on the screen. There it is. Um, so go over there for me. Yeah, we're at 17 people, which is great. Um, go over and follow that. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see we have nine hours and 22 minutes as of uh, right now until this thing starts, it starts at midnight and it runs for four days. So the, the criteria here on this project are any observations that come in from April the 24th to the 27th in any of the 16 county regions surrounding Chattanooga. And then here's, the, here's what that looks like on a map. Oops, I just zoomed out, way out. <laughs> uh, so this is what that 16 county region looks like. And we are definitely going to see a lot of cool stuff because if you roll up and go over to the main Thrive project, this is a project that I've had going uh, that just collects everything that is, is being observed in that same region. And so you can see somebody saw a house finch three minutes ago. Uh, we've got some resurrection fern in here. Uh, lots of cool stuff. And then if you roll down, you'll start to see stats, which is cool. Um, you can see how many still need IDs, how many have achieved research grade, and then how many are just casual observations. Um, on the needs ID, this is where we're going to need a lot of help for uh, during the actual challenge and in the, the few days kind of uh, – Hey, welcome back, Zach. Hold on a sec. I'm going to finish my Sorry, thought here. Uh, uh, keeps on. No worries. Um, so one of the things that we're going to really need help with is for people to go and start clicking on this needs ID. When you click on that, it's actually going to bring up everything that still needs an ID. And you can go in and you can, you can kind of change the way you're looking at it into a few different ways. Um, I kind of prefer the list if I'm doing IDs because I can run through it real quick. And I'll jump in and, and just find something like liar leaf sage. I, I'm confident enough that I can ID that. Um, yeah, that's definitely what it is. I'm going to click agree here. One thing I'm going to do, I talked a little bit about annotations earlier. I'm actually going to add to the plant phenology that there it, that it is flowering. And you can actually do more than one on that. So if there were flowers budding, you can do that as well. Um, and you can also do sex. Um, it, as Once you get down to a, I think, most like the family level, you'll start to see different annotations. So for birds, it might say um, there's life stage on there, and it will say 
egg, uh, adult, you know, juvenile, that kind of thing. Um, so this is one of those things where if you have the, the knowledge, especially of plants, we definitely need your help. Um, all right, Zach, why don't you go back in? Uh, you were about hey, halfway through the climate. There's a, I think there's a bad connection in the attic and my computer keeps dying and shutting off and it's a new computer. So I don't deal with. Uh, but yeah, this is, um, so I use on a lot when I'm studying a group of plants like clematis to find localities because it's just quick, you know, I search, you know, clematis v. Orna pulls up all the localities and I can go in and if they're misidentified, correct that for people. But then I can go and actually to the population and collect the samples I need, whether it's leaf samples to send off for DNA analysis or just overall vouchers to study the herbarium material. But this is a, uh, we were talking about diagnostic character. So for this plant, you want everything fanned out when you press it to where you can see the uh, leaf dissection. And then you can also see the architecture of the flowers because that's really important. But this plant is unique because um, it has a form of glandular pubescence. So their hairs with glands that cover the leaves and the stem. As I was saying earlier, it was uh, named uh, by J.K. Small, a uh, botanist from New York, uh, for Austin Gattinger, the first botanist in Tennessee. And this thing has was largely not known from the landscape, and actually Dwayne rediscovered it. And we've been working on it for a long time now, and it is a distinct species, and we're gonna be resurrecting it, so it'll actually be uh, accepted as a taxa again, and come back from the dead, basically. Because at one time it was proposed as a candidate uh, to be listed and it was studied back then and they didn't think it was a legitimate species. But with a lot of this new data, it's showing that it's uh, really needs to be renamed and resurrected. So that's, that's cool. what we're doing. Yeah. Hey, do you have any examples um, of how, how would you press acorns? Oh, well, that, that's, uh, you know, when you collect, if you're collecting oaks in the fall you just take a clipping of the branch with the acorns on that. And as you press it, it'll be fine. And then you can also collect the acorns too, as long as you label it to go back to that number. So when you collect specimens, you have a number. So this is uh, my name, then my collection number 773. And you could do it by the year or just overall. You just want to link those that collection of the acorns back to whatever uh, specimen you have. So. Cool. Um, let me, I'm going to go back real quick and get back into iNaturalist and show you a couple of the other things. Let's see. Um, let me go. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Are you seeing a list right now? No, okay. Uh, no, it's a split screen. Okay, there's a list. Um, yeah. All right, so there, I, I have filtered down to everything in the 16 county region that does not have an ID. And so you can see there's 44,000 observations there that don't have a uh, research grade ID yet. So there's sort of a lot of work to be done. Um, so we definitely need your help. Here's, okay, here's a good one that I'll talk about. Uh, when I was talking about IDing to the level that you are comfortable with, this unknown ID does not have much, just not putting any ID at all does not have much value. Um, and it's gonna be hard for people who are specializing in that taxa to find it. And so what I'm gonna do here is just go find a, uh, a better ID. I don't know what it is. This is certainly not my area of expertise. So I'm actually just gonna type insect. Uh, it's pulling up Dobson flies. It kind of looks like a, a, a larvae of a Dobson fly. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I don't, I don't have enough expertise, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to say insect. And the reason why I say this is that even if you don't know anything about IDing these things, if you know that's an insect, that's actually a valuable ID um, because that's going to kick it off onto the right path and get it into the right group of folks that might be able to to help um so definitely when you when you upload it even if you just you just know that it's a plant just put plant and that'll help and then i'm going to enlist people like zach to come help us uh, actually figure out what that is one thing i'll do too is show you 
going to stop and change back to my slides because I can show you what that looks like on the mobile app. And that is what it looks like right here. Um, all right, so you can type, let's say we know it's a fern. I can actually type fern and go get the class. Um, I can also just type plant, like I said. And if you really don't know what it is, you can do state of matter life. <laughs> and that- It's pretty broad. Um, it's pretty broad. I've used it a couple of times, not very often, but I've used it a couple of times. Um, usually when it's like some blob of something and you can't really tell like, is that, is that a fungus? Is that a, uh, a gall from a, a wasp? That is, uh, you know, laid eggs on this plant. So it's kind of a cool, uh, it's a cool platform. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, that's pretty much all we had on our side. I thought it'd be fun to get, <laughs> it'd be fun to get Zach on here and uh, learn a little bit more from him about how to ID plants. Yeah. Um Really, you know, we're in a really great area to go out and look at plants and really anything. We've got really significant plant communities, you know, even here at Reflection Riding, but within, you know, a 30 minute drive, hour, hour drive, two hour drive, really we're in a really center of endemism of plants. So we're in a pandemic right now, but uh, on a positive note, we're in a great endemic, you know, area for vascular plants. And so usually it just depends on, um, you know, the growth form of the plant that you're looking at. So if it's a woody plant, a tree, I like to get a good picture of the bark of the silhouette of the canopy and then uh, leaf structures, if you can reach them. And uh, that really helps, especially if you're dealing with something that's complex, like oak, oaks or hick. Keep losing Zach. He's got a problem with his computer today. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. If you have any other questions, put them in the comments. They're down there for me, but wherever they are. Um, if you're on YouTube, follow us. There should be a, a subscribe button. We'll keep posting new ones. We actually have a really cool one coming up with Dr. David Aborn from UTC. He's going to be doing a bird banding demonstration. So he's actually going to set up uh, a net, a, a mist net, capture some birds, put bands on them. Uh, he's also going to, we're going to ask him a few questions about the new MODIS tracking station, which is going to be installed at our facility at Reflection Riding, and that is uh, M-O-D-U-S, I believe. It's uh, Latin for movement, but it is a really cool platform where we're going to be able to see. It's kind of the evolution of bird banding. So we're going to be able to see in real time how organi organisms are moving across our property. Um, we also have one, let me see, we have Julia Gregory from the Tennessee Aquarium. She's going to be doing a, uh, a moth and insect specific um, presentation, which should be pretty fun. And then uh, if anybody else is interested, let me know. We obviously are, are seeking out experts in different little critters and plants. So uh, let me put this back up real quick so you can follow us, but make sure you Make sure you join our project at reflectionriding.org slash CNC. Zach, we've got to get you a new computer before we do this again. No, I, I keep getting booted up here in the attic, man. <laughs> uh, it must be our internet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the deal is. This keeps restarting. Um, yeah, hey, I enjoyed it, and I hope to actually get out in the field with people in the future once uh, this is all over. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I didn't really mention, but you know, Zach had – uh, we had a whole series of different hikes and, and experiences and learning things that we were planning to do. Um, one of the ones that I can't wait to do is, is the plant pressing and learning from you how to uh, press plants and create good specimens. So um, if you have, uh, if anybody's looking, if anybody's watching from the mountain, from Lookout or Signal Mountain, hold on to your mountain mirrors. Turns out the mountain mirror is the perfect size for uh, yeah. our plant and we we are taking them we we would appreciate if you set them aside for us um, yeah it and then, uh, fits perfectly to this cardboard and yeah actually ironically I don't, I don't think i told you this zach but you're the second person to ask me to hang on to those because okay. taylor needs them. they're also the exact same size as our uh, bird crates that we use for travel right. so we, we put them in the bottom of our bird crates to uh 
to make yeah. it easier to clean them up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so hang on to your mirrors, and uh, they're they're doing the same too. Actually, they're they're going to hang on to them for us when they have extras. Yeah, and hopefully we can plan some field trips in the later this year when all this stuff clears up. Because you know you went on a few field trips with us already before all this broke yeah. out in North Carolina, and uh, yeah. all the stuff we could do closer to here. Yeah, um, Jessica actually says that the, the attic Wi-Fi loves to mess with us. So uh, that, that's all right. I'm not worried. We'll to, yeah, we'll have to figure out how to get you uh, hardwired in for the next one. But yeah, I've been on some cool field trips already with uh, Zach and the team at SGI. Um, probably the coolest was the one where I got to see uh, the uh, Serpentine Baron. Yeah, that was really cool up in outside of Highlands, North yeah. Carolina. Right. And that's uh, also, too, what's really important about iNaturalist is when you delineate that as a project site, all the observations get uploaded into that project. And then if you want to go and, say, export a CBS file of all the species that are there, you can do it in a matter of minutes. You know, it's just really a great tool. And everyone uses it, too, from citizen scientists to scientists. It's great for everyone. Let me. We have a few more minutes, and, and um, let me actually go show you what that looks like, because it is a really cool thing. If you ever, if you're interested in finding a particular plant or any species, you can go um, go to iNaturalist. Let me go. Let me kick that one out again. Share share this screen here. Okay, so I'm going to find something. Uh, what's something we should find? How about that Ligodium again? Uh, yeah, Ligodium palmatum. All right, so we're talking about Ligodium palmatum. Uh, I'm curious to see where it occurs. I am currently in a project. I'm going to go to this filter and get rid of that project. So now I'm just looking at, uh, I've got it at needs ID too. So I'm going to just open it up to any any observations of this particular species. I've got 244 if you've been on iNaturalist a little bit, you'll realize how rare this plant is if it only has 244 observations. Uh, it's pretty unusual. And then let's pull this over so you can actually see it. My internet's going kind of slow too, I believe. Um, all right, so you can see this is kind of an eastern plant. Got it up almost to Maine, I guess probably. Yeah, northern Vermont is the farthest north and then goes down into our region. How about Trillium lancifolium? Pull that up. You know, that's right here on Reflection Riding's property. That's a, a really unique and great, you know, addition to this place. That is a cool thing. Um, actually, did you find it the other day when we were looking? Uh, I had to leave? No, I didn't. I actually had to leave right after that. Yeah, I have not found one blooming this year, but this is a really cool plant. Um, let me see if I can find one here. One thing that you can do in these filters too, you can go to your observations. Yeah. When you click that, it'll come down to just yours. So I, I've observed this twice on the platform. Um, and this will be one of those where the, the location will be automatically obscured because this is. It's an endangered plant. It, it is a Tennessee endangered, although it's not listed. I don't know why it's not listed on there, but this, that's what it looks like. Um, let me go back to the one that was blooming and a little more interesting. Yeah, here's the blooming one. So, beautiful, interesting trillion. Uh, yeah, and there's actually some people doing uh, some research on a trillion that's pretty similar to that, that they think is a cryptic uh, species on the slopes of lookout it's up on the trail by uh, ruby falls on that road and they're thinking that they that might be a new species and they were proposing to name it after a guy who did a lot of work in trillium uh they were going to call it trillium free mania but i don't know what the status of it is and what, what is that when you say it's a cryptic species explain that you can't uh you can't separate them physically you know by your observations it's either by some kind of uh dna sequence or some kind of chemical uh, chemotaxonomy is what they call it, some kind of uh, compound that it 
uh, has that separates it from the other species. And uh, there's cryptic taxa that are now being split out and it just, people, some people agree with it, some people don't, but uh, they're, they've been doing research on that. And there's been several trilliums that have been named recently that all seem to be pretty good species in Northeast Tennessee. There's actually a trillium called Trillium Tennesseeense. That's probably one of the most beautiful trillium I've ever, that I've seen. So you Google that and look at that trillium because, um, and then Trillium Georgianum, not too far from us, was named not too long ago. Uh, seems like there's a lot of stuff going on in that group. So, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm actually just gonna try it out because it's not one that I'm aware of. Trillium Trillium Tennesseeense. Yeah. Say that for me again. Tennesseeense. Yeah, the first photo, the first observation. That's cool. It's one of the coolest trilliums I've seen, yeah. Huh. One of the coolest described yeah. ones. Very cool. So that one had, let me see how many observations that one had. That one has four observations, <laughs> so incredibly right. rare. Rare, yeah. yeah. It's rare in northeast Tennessee, um, off I-81, once you get up in the Tri-City area. Well, we'll have to go find that one, Zach. Yeah, then another plant, you know, in here that's, you know, Scutellaria Montana, that's another significant plant that's uh, in this area on your, you know, on lookout and things like that. Yeah, I never know how to spell that. <laughs> uh, S-C-U-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-A. -L -L there it is. Yeah. Oops, missed my T. This will probably have slightly more. Yeah, 17. Not. Yeah, it's really common in our area, but it has a very narrow range. It also grows, there's a plant that grows within the population with it that looks pretty identical called Scutellaria pseudo serrata, and they get misidentified all the time. And uh, they can be, it can really be challenging. And so they've got them flagged probably because if you don't flag them, you may count Scutellaria pseudo serrata and bias the. Uh, size of the population. Because some of the populations I've surveyed have had lots of uh, admixed pseudo serrata in Montana. Hmm. And that was at Chattanooga Military Park. Okay. So look out now. <laughs> um, all right, guys, thanks so much for coming. I am gonna do uh, one little advertisement here. I need to this slide back up. Let's see. Um, if you are looking for native plants to do your own habitat restoration, whether it's in your backyard or place of business, uh, come find us. You can find us at reflectionwriting.org slash plants. And um, our guys have done a great job kind of pivoting um, since we have to at this point, obviously do either pickup or delivery and you can't come shop for plants on site. Um, what, what you do is you go in, fill out go to this website, fill out the interest form and you can kind of go, you can split one or the other. You can either say, yeah, I know what I want. And then you can list it and we'll call you back and send you an invoice. Or you can say, I don't know what I want and I want to talk to an expert. Um, you can talk to Dylan or Scotty or one of our other uh, volunteers who are helping us out with this. And they'll talk through it with you if you have a, you know, semi uh, shaded area in your backyard that is fairly dry. You know, you can talk through what types of things might work for that. And uh, so far, it's been it's been working pretty well. It's kind of a lifeline for us right now when we have no income coming in from any of the field trips or anything like that. So thanks so much for the support. Uh, everybody who has done that. And Zach, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks, thanks again. Uh, thanks for watching. Stay yeah. tuned. Uh, hope we have be safe. Yeah. Yeah, everybody, be safe at home. And uh, we do have the next one. We have another one tomorrow, two o'clock. Join us for Matt Wicker, landscape architect, also a huge plant geek that uh, should have some fun things to talk about. Uh, two o'clock tomorrow, live on YouTube and Facebook.
Thanks, everybody. See you, Zach. All right. See ya. Thank you.